developed uh, a basic study of some of the models of the hyperbolic plane, uh, namely the hyperboloid, the upper half plane, and the Poincare disk. Uh, although there are some uh, other models I have not uh, talked about. Um, so having uh, spoken about the hyperboloid, the upper half plane, and the Poincare disk, uh, let us move on to um, this uh, short chapter about a hyperbolic area and a hyperbolic uh, trigonometry. Mm -hmm. So uh, today we are going to uh, cover a uh, hyperbolic area, the basic facts about the hyperbolic area, and we are going to use uh, those facts uh, to prove uh, this fam the famous formula of Gauss-Bonnet for uh, the area of a hyperbolic triangle. Um, so, uh, we define the area, the hyperbolic area, of a subset uh, of the upper half plane mm -hmm. uh, as follows, so in terms of this integral, right? So, so you, the usual area, the usual uh, Euclidean area would be, you know, we wouldn't write this, we would only have this integral, right? So, um, so it's kind of, a, it's kind of, uh, we weight somehow um, the points and kind of uh, and, and again the, the points close to uh, to, to R bar um, become very heavy. Yeah? So okay, so that's the formula. If this integral exists, right? Um, and then I take it as the, the Riemann integral for for simplicity, um, as as opposed to uh, some Lebesgue integral. I take the, the Riemann integral. Um, and then, of course, one of the first things we would like is that uh, whatever our, our area is, whatever our definition of area is, that it be invariant on their isometries. Yeah. Um, so you see, the important thing is that it be uh, invariant on their orientation preserving isometries. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, the first property we established that uh, if the if the area of a subset uh, exists, so that this Riemann, Riemann integral really exists, um, and I take an orientation preserving um, um, isometry, uh, then the the area of the image of of my subset on the the isometry uh, exists and is equal to the area of the original set. So let's prove it. Uh, the, the, the proof comes down to, uh, to the fact that the, that the Jacobian um, is related, that, that the Jacobian of nu is related to, uh, to the norm of certain complex number. So let's, let's see it. So let's write, you see, we can, we can of course, since, since nu, nu is a function from u to u, right? we can of course write it as uh, as its um, real and in terms of its real and imaginary part, where u and v then are functions that take uh, real values. Right? Okay, so let's write it that way. I mean, of course, we can say more, right? That we can say that actually v v uh, always takes positive. V always takes positive values on no matter where we evaluate it in U. Right? So that's, that's something we can say, for instance. Uh -huh. um, okay, and then since since uh, you know we, we want to compare uh, an integral, uh, you know, certain integral and, and an integral after applying nu, so we, we we of course want to compute the the Jacobian of nu as a function, you know, as a, as a function of uh, from let's say from R two to R two. Okay, so so the definition is that it's the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives of the of the two functions, right? And then the thing is, you see, this this is this matrix is uh, the the matrix that represents the derivative of nu. But when 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 I see nu as a function of two two variables, right? So, so this, this, this really is, uh, is I mean, that, that derivative is 
coincides with multiplying by a, 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 a complex number, right? So this, this, this matrix really is the matrix that represents multiplying by a complex number. And so it has the form, let's say, uh, A, uh, B minus B, A. Um, okay, so, so, so this means that when I take this determinant, it really is uh, this one square plus this one square. Um, and if you want, if you want when, I, when, I, when I say that this matrix is, uh, coincides with multiplication by a complex number and so on, you can say that I'm applying the cauchy riemann uh, equations. Uh -huh. uh, and this one, of course, uh, is, the, is the, the absolute value, the, the, the norm square, sorry, the norm square uh, of the derivative, as a, the derivative of nu as a, as a function of, comple of, of a complex variable. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now, this one, you remember that we had computed a uh, new prime uh, in terms of nu, right? Actually, we did it when uh, we wanted to show that, uh, that the elements of, of PSL2R uh, are uh, isometries of the upper half plane. Uh, we computed that, uh -huh. and, and this one, you know, with, without the absolute, without the norm and without the square, this one was one divided by uh, gamma z plus delta square. Right? So that was nu prime. This is nu prime in z. Right. So when I take its norm square, I obtain this. Okay. And of course, I mean, uh, I mean this. Of course, of course, once I once I write. Uh, nu as the Mobius transformation of a matrix uh, in SL2R, right? So in particular, the fact that, that, on, that uh, in, the, in the numerator, I have a determinant one, sorry, I have, a, I have a one, this one is actually the determinant of F, if you remember. Okay, anyway, um, in the end, the, the Jacobian, which governs the change of variable when, when, I, comp when I compute integrals, uh, is, is equal to this. Um, okay, and so, so uh, when I compute the area of nu of x, this, you, you see this, uh, this is equal to this uh, integral, where of course, I mean here I can write the, the whatever symbol, right, and the whatever other symbol, provided, provided this symbol is the one I write here, right, so that's why I write in terms of u and v, you know, using the symbols u and v instead of uh, x and y. Right? Um, okay. And I do that because precisely, you know, when I write this, uh, I, I, I think that I'm going to use the change of variable, right? Nu equal to something, right? So this is what I can do. Right? This is the change of variable I can do. Mm -hmm. um, but then here is the, the Jacobian. Okay, so I, uh, I substitute it. So notice that this V becomes uh, uh, this V of x, y squared. Mm -hmm. It's a function of two variables. Um, okay, so here's the Jacobian. Uh -huh. And then, then you see this, this uh, of course, V, V of x, y is uh, the imaginary part. Let's, let's say v of x, y is, is v of z, when I write z as x plus i, y, and its imaginary part. I also computed um, at some point, right? I, I think I also computed it when uh, in the same theorem where I showed that, uh, that the elements of PSL2 are, are isometries of the upper half plane. Mm -hmm. Because this one was the, the imaginary part of, uh, of uh, z, Divided by um, by what, what was it? By, what, by gamma z plus delta square, right? Norm square. Mm -hmm. So this one square, well, you have to put the imaginary part of z, but now it, of course in the denominator, and this square is this square, mm -hmm. and then and then here this one to the fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then you see coincidence. This cancels, 
So what I what, what I obtain is this integral, which is the area of x. Right. So uh, so this proves the theorem. Right. So if this one, you know, if if, the, if if this integral exists, then the other one exists as well, and they are equal. Um, okay. Uh, and then let us immediately um, apply uh, this theorem to obtain the famous formula of uh, gauss bonnet mm -hmm. So uh, let us define a hyperbolic polygon uh -huh, of, with n sides or n vertices, uh -huh, or simply a hyperbolic n-gon, mm -hmm, to be a, a compact connected subset of u-bar or d bar, right? So, so, so here, here, there's no mistake, right? So here is of the topological closure in c bar of either either of these guys, depending depending on whether you are working in this in the model upper half plane or in the Poincaré disk model. Um, okay, compact connected subset of that, and the point is the point is that I'm I I'm going to allow that I'm going to allow uh, my polygons to perhaps have some points in uh, in the circle at infinity, which would be r bar in the case of u, or would be the unit circle in the case of d. Um, some some points there yeah, as vertices. That's uh, that's that I'm allowing some points, some some points from the circle at infinity to be vertices of this and going. So that's why I say that. Uh -huh. Um, okay, uh, and then the rest is kind of uh, kind of the formalism, right? Of, of, uh, of okay, so that the 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 boundary, you know, the boundary of of of, of, of my figure uh -huh, has to be, you know, has, has to consist of of n n segments, right? Of um, of shortest curves, right? But now, of course, since let's say in U, I'm allowing my hyperbole polygon to perhaps have some points from this R bar, the circular infinity. Uh, so maybe you see this one. Oops. So so uh, so I have this shortest curve, and of course, this end point is not part of the shortest curve. Uh -huh. So that's why I say topological closure. Right? So to allow this point. To be part of this segment, and then let's say this, and then let's say this. This would, this would look like a, a like hyperbolic three gon, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, and of course the the segments the segments are called the sides, right, of, of my uh, n gon, uh -huh. and uh, the intersection points of two segments, right. So when I have two segments. Uh, these ones are the vertices. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to see uh, uh, some examples in a moment. Okay, so let us see some uh, examples of uh, convex hyperbolic polygons. Uh, first in uh, in U in the upper half plane, and then uh, in the Poincaré disk. Mm -hmm. So uh, here I picked a convex hull. Uh -huh. So so whenever I Click on points; it uh, it draws the the convex hull between them. So if I if I um, click on two points, uh, it gives me the, the the shortest curve joining them. Uh -huh. And so a third point. So so this is how a uh, hyperbolic triangle with um, you know with uh, all three uh, vertices uh, belonging to U, so being finite points, looks like. Uh -huh. So and then let's move. So if I move it, in the, the, if I move the, vert, the vertex, the corresponding triangle moves, and you see the ones that have a point at infinity look like this. Point at infinity as a vertex, uh -huh. and then you see that, that at some points there are some errors, which may be errors of floating point or uh, programming errors. This I will have to go through the code to. to to make sure, but okay, uh -huh. okay, and then this is three with three sides. Let's say four sides, All right? And then I can also move around. That is all. Is only a triangle. Uh -huh. 
Okay. I mean, this one is only a triangle, right? I mean, because it has only three vertices. Uh, let's say uh, five points. Uh, yeah, so this is how a, a, a convex pentagon, non-regular, or not necessarily regular, let's say, uh, looks like, etc. Um, let's go to the Poincaré disk, uh, and then let's see. Well, a hyperbolic triangle uh, with all three vertices belonging to D. So D in finite points looks like. So this looks more like a, a, a vertex with a, 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 a triangle with one vertex at infinity. Let's put the three vertices, let's say, at infinity. Uh -huh. So this is how a, a triangle with uh, three vertices at infinity looks like. These are usually called ideal triangles, right? Because the three vertices are ideal vertices, right? I mean, um, points at infinity. Uh -huh. Notice notice that, that if you give me this triangle, you see, you give me that one that you are seeing. And this new one, after moving, um, there always is an orientation preserving isometry between one triangle to the other. And this, this I may leave as an exercise. Yeah. Um, and this is reminiscent from, uh, from the, the simple transitivity of the action of mod plus C bar on uh, triples of distinct points of C bar. Mm -hmm. So in other words, any two ideal triangles are isometric. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see quadrilaterals. So this is how a quadrilateral. So let's say an ideal square. Well, an ideal quadrilateral would look like this. Not square, quadrilateral. And here you see, you see, if I take this this ideal quadrilateral or this ideal quadrilateral. Then, then there may fail to exist uh, an orientation preserving isometry taking one to the other because that orientation preserving isometry would have in particular to be given as a Morris transformation. And we know that, that it is not true that given two, uh, two four tuples of distinct points of C bar, uh, given any two, there does not necessarily exist a Morris transformation taking one to the other. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the theorem of Gauss Bonnet tells me if you pick a hyperbolic trigon, so a, a hyperbolic triangle, so three, uh, three vertices or three sides. Um, and you measure the internal angles of, uh, of the triangle, and, and recall that, that uh, uh, the, 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 the angle between two curves at a point at, at a crossing point is defined to be um, the angle between uh, the tangent vectors. Yeah? Um, that can be measured, you know, because because I have an inner product on that on, on, the, on that tangent plane. Okay? So that's how I measure angles. Um, okay, and, and, and the theorem says that, yeah, we have this beautiful formula, which says that, that the area is fully determined by the angles according to this formula. Mm -hmm. so, so, so in particular, you see th these are really hints to the fact that, that, uh, that, um, that, 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 that one cannot really have uh, similar triangles of different sizes somehow, right? Because somehow, uh, no? uh, I mean, uh, the size is determined by the angles. No? Uh, later on, when we when we speak about uh, uh, trigon trigonometry, uh, we're going to see that actually um, one can actually, uh, 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 if one has a, a certain triangles with the same angles, one can take one to the other with an isometry. Mm -hmm. 
So, so kind of something even stronger than, than just saying that the, 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 the size is determined. Um, but okay, but for, for now, let's, uh, let's prove this theorem. Uh -huh. And we are going to, to do it uh, like I, uh, people usually do it, which is um, in two cases. In the, in the first case, I'm going to assume that, that my triangle has uh, at least one vertex lying on the circle at infinity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to work in the, in the upper half plane model. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to work on U. So I'm going to assume that at least one of the side, one of the vertices lies in, in the circle at infinity. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So so this means so you see so 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 this means in particular that over there uh, the angle the angle is uh, is zero, right? The angle the, the internal angle of the, of my triangle at, at that point at that vertex is zero. Um, this, this is this is because like this can be easily seen because you see if if you draw r bar and then let's say you have you have uh, that vertex of, of my triangle you see this one is orthogonal um, this one is orthogonal to r bar because it, it, it is ortho orthogonal to r bar at the point of intersection because it, it it's a shortest curve, but this one too. So this means that these two are, are really tangent, but being tangent means that the, 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 this angle is zero. And of course, you may say, okay, it doesn't look like zero. Well, I mean, the point is, is here is in, the, in the, between the tangents, right? So, okay. Um, okay, so it's zero. Uh -huh. And now the next thing. Um, up to applying uh, 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 an orientation preserving isometry, so an element of PSL 2R, uh, I can assume that um, that that vertex, the, oops, I'm sorry, that the vertex that I'm assuming lies on the on R bar or the, on, on the circle at infinity is actually the point at infinity of C bar. Um, for instance, this, this can be easily seen if you move to, to D, and then in D, uh, in D, it, 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 you one can see that one can apply rotations to take any any given point in circular infinity, uh, let's say to the point I. So this translated to R bar means that that uh, that it's always possible to move any point to infinity. Uh, by means of uh, an orientation preserving isometry. Okay, once that's the case, uh, one really has a picture like uh, like this one that you are seeing here, because because one point is one vertex is the point at infinity, and then they are kind of vertical. The other sides, sorry, the the, the adjacent sides they look Euclidianly vertical. Okay, but then you see, you see, uh, you can move, you can move this, this uh, to the to the right or to the left. Right? You can move it so that so that uh, you see the, the third side, which is then as the segment of uh, of an Euclidean circle in C. Uh, so that that so that that the circle of which it's a segment um, is the origin. It's uh, the origin of, uh, of, of C of R two, okay. and you can move it. And, and when you move it, you move when you horizontal motions. They are uh, isometries of the upper half plane, so no problem. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, I, we can even uh, assume that the Euclidean radius of this of this uh, of this circle of this circle uh, is one. By by uh, applying you see applying a, a applying a, um, a homothety right, of the form this with a lambda a positive real number mm -hmm. because any such Mobius transformation obviously preserves U um, and hence is an isometry of U so uh, so up to applying uh, uh, orientation preserving uh, an orientation preserving uh, isometry of U, 
Mm -hmm. I can assume that that this that that this is the picture I have, where here I have a radius one, a Euclidean radius equal to one. Okay. okay. Now, next, uh, here, 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 I, I reproduced this uh, this picture, right? But with some more information. And you see, the thing is here, this, this, this segment that I just drew here is drawn here. Uh -huh. And I claim that the angle is precisely this angle alpha. Mm -hmm. um, that is equal to, to this alpha, which is, of course, an internal triangle, an internal angle of my triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you see, this is, this, this is because of the following. So, so uh, take take uh, uh, the the Euclidean the Euclidean tangent to the to the unit circle at this point uh, so at this point which is a vertex of my triangle of my hyperbolic triangle take the tangent and, and yeah mm -hmm. so uh, because of uh, the, uh, my Euclidean geometry this angle is equal to this angle yeah? uh, but then you see this one is ninety degrees. This one is 90 degrees, uh -huh. so this one has to be equal to this one, okay. and I'm done. And similarly, uh, when I take, when I go from this vertex of my hyperbolic triangle to the origin, the angle is beta with the same proof. Okay, so what does that imply? This implies before before I keep going, um, for instance, that. When I take cosine of beta, cosine of beta is is this uh, you see is is this length, this sine length, where I'm simply projecting uh, this the vertex of my hyperbolic triangle to the x-axis, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you see um, and you see uh, a a I mean all again if I project this vertex to the x-axis, uh -huh. this a is the sine length, or if you want, is the, is the cosine of, well, not of alpha, but of pi minus alpha. Right? The cosine of pi minus alpha, is, it would be precisely this. So that's the point. Uh -huh. So, so if, you, if you want, when I project and I project, what I have is that the cosine of beta is b, and the cosine of pi minus alpha is a. That's what I'm going to use mm -hmm. because now, uh, I'm, now I'm going to compute the area I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. It's this integral. This integral, uh, well, you see, uh, it, 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 I have to integrate over this, this region. Right? So it's the integral from from A to B uh -huh, of well from this curve up upwards. Right? So from one minus x squared to infinity, and then you know my integrand. Okay, this is equal to this. It's, it's, you see, this is an improper integral, so I write it a certain limit. Uh, this one, this one, it's easy to find an anti, an anti derivative, right? It's minus one, one over y. Here's the computation. You, you see, you let t go to infinity. This one goes to zero, and I'm left with this, and then I, and then I'm left with this integral, and then I I uh, I perform a kind of an obvious change of variable, um, and then but then you see I, I have to to substitute dx with the derivative of cosine, which is minus sine. Um, and then this this one becomes the sine. So I have the integral of minus one. From 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 what from from a you see you see since I'm saying x is equal to cosine of theta, I have to grab something whose cosine is a and something whose cosine is b. Um, and yeah, kind of the arc cosine actually. Right? So pi minus alpha to beta. Right, so, so because of what I said here about these projections, pi minus alpha and cosine of theta. Okay. Right, but then you see, then now I just I just evaluate, 
right? And then I'm left with pi minus alpha minus beta. And since since the third angle is zero, well, I here of course can write minus gamma because, because that gamma is zero. So in my first case, when uh, one of the vertices is assumed to have uh, one of the vertices assumed to be uh, on, to lie on the circle at infinity, uh, the theorem is proof. Um, okay, and of, and of course, notice that that in order to kind of to, to to arrive at this very particular configuration, is that we used. Uh, the invariance of the hyperbolic area on the uh, on the orientation preserving isometries. Okay. By the way, I would leave you would leave it to you as an exercise that that now knowing that uh, that the hyperbolic area is invariant on the all orientation preserving isometries. Now prove that it is that the hyperbolic area is invariant on the arbitrary isometries of the upper half plane. Uh, I would say it's easier than it sounds. Okay, um, let's go to the second case, okay, when where we assume that all three vertices of, of my hyperbolic triangle uh, are finite points. They do not lie on the circle at infinity. Okay. So, my, so the situation is, you, you see like the one I'm seeing here, so this would be my uh, triangle that would be my triangle okay and what do I do do I do um, uh, so what I do is I take one of the sides and then one take I take uh, you see one of the sides adjacent to it and then continue to the, to the circle at infinity and then from that point at infinity, I kind of I go back to the to the other vertex lying on this uh, on the side I took. And then I close with the third side, so that I have I have a bigger triangle now that now has a point at infinity, a vertex lying on the circle at infinity, uh -huh. and because in that case I, I already know the theorem. Uh, and so what I know is that you see the the air, the hyperbolic area of this big triangle uh -huh, would be equal or is equal to the to this area that I'm interested in mm -hmm. uh, plus this other area which I know how to compute. Right? So I know how to compute two of the three areas, uh -huh. and then the the big one is well I just take the angles right, which would be alpha, and then here, because of the way I, I went from here to here, this, this, uh, if this is beta, this, this, the complement is pi minus, is pi minus beta. Mm -hmm. And then here I would have gamma plus some other angle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so it would be pi, pi minus alpha minus this, right? And this, of course, is not an angle. Of, of, of the big one. Okay, now uh, the small one, the small one, what, what's its area? It's pi minus this, which is theta, mm -hmm, which is here, minus this, which is p minus beta. So you want pi minus the sum of this one and this one. Okay, so I arrive at the equality, which one? This equality. Okay. And so you see here I have minus theta, and here I have minus theta, well, that cancels. I have plus beta, and I have, uh, yeah, plus beta, so it passes as minus beta. Mm -hmm. And here this P cancels, uh -huh. and I'm done, right? So the area I wanted is this pi minus alpha plus gamma minus beta, and I'm done. Okay, and then I'm I'm done with the two uh, with the two cases, mm -hmm. and then and then as a corollary, one can compute the hyperbolic area of any uh, convex polygon 
with uh, with the finite the many sides with n sides, mm -hmm. um, which I leave as an exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, notice notice that that uh, since in the definition in the definition of hyperbolic n gone, uh, the sides uh -huh, the sides which are these uh, segments. Mm -hmm. Since they are segments of topological closures of shortest curves, uh -huh, uh, one never has, you see, like if I draw R bar, uh, a segment, a segment of R bar is never a side, right? Because I mean, uh, you, I mean, it's not, it's not a seg, it's not a segment of a. Uh, of the topological closure of a geodesic, right? um, so only really only 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 you know only things of the form segment of geodesic, perhaps union, perhaps some point at infinity, are sides of, uh, of polygons at least with this definition. Right? Um, Okay, and um, then next class we are going to do some uh, a little bit like basic trigonometry, and uh, and um, yeah. Okay.